good afternoon everyone and a very warm welcome to all of you joining us this time particularly on youtube due to a certain technical lapse we cannot go on live simultaneously on facebook for this particular session but we are coming to you live on youtube today is a very special day because we are joined by a serious erudite academician of west bengal dr shormista chatterjee srivastav and i consider this to be my honor and privilege to introduce her to all of you dr shormista chatterjee srivastav is associate professor and head at the department of english in alia university kolkata her doctoral thesis is on indian poetry in english she is also closely associated with the english and foreign languages university hyderabad she has been a trainer and a local coordinator in the project capacity building for women managers in higher education from 2007 to 2013 funded by university grants commission india her wide range of interests include south asian literature shakespeare translation studies post colonial studies eco criticism gender studies modern linguistics and english language teaching she has been published widely in national and international books and journals her ugc sponsored minor research project has been published as a book entitled language and power a socio linguistic study of the works of amitabh ghosh by lap lambert germany two of her recent edited books are an anthology of translated short stories entitled missing links stories from bengal and beyond from authors press new delhi and an anthology of critical essays entitled travel writing travel and writing published by bishwakosh parishad eastern india today she is going to speak on between the sense of home and unhomeliness narratives of indian partition and bangladesh liberation war dr srivastav is a wonderful speaker and i particularly am very fond of her poise and elegance so here is welcoming for the first time vidyapur college autonomous dr shormista chatterjee srivastav before i formally invite her to begin her talk let me just request all of you to uh, please post your questions in the comment box of your uh, of the youtube and later our pg coordinator professor tanmay kundu will be conveying these questions to dr chatterjee so shormista ji please uh, thank you uh... Professor Sharkar, for those very kind words, I am humbled. Uh, I begin, of course, with my gratitude to Midnapur College and especially uh, Professor Sharkar and Professor Tanmay Kundu, who gave me this opportunity to share my thoughts at this uh, platform, where many eminent faculties uh, I have heard have been speaking for the past months. Uh, I consider this my honor and privilege too. as told to you i talk today about uh, between the title is between the sense of home and unhomeliness narratives of indian partition and the bangladesh liberation war uh, without wasting time i think i carry on where i also explain how i'm going to approach this topic now i begin with a very oft uh, uh, quoted line from uh, gabriel garcia marquez's 100 years of solitude where uh, it's it's written so uh, i quote a person doesn't belong to a place until there's someone dead under the ground in quote uh, but my question is is it always the truth uh, does the person belong mm. even well after uh, somebody's dead under the ground in the subcontinent uh, riddled with the history of partition and migrant cultures even having moved after having moved generations ago and stayed generation after the sense of home i believe and all of you would i believe eludes many such migrants and even those who haven't migrated those who have found and claimed a home in this new space uh, those who have crossed over and moved in search of hope and security why does where we live mean so much in a country as diverse as ours the first thing we ask probably each other about where is home where is your home maybe because it helps to know whether we can identify and relate to each other such so sense of home is also the sense of belongingness inclusiveness and above all safety marquez's claim 
is often proven false in the narratives of 1947 partition in our part of the world, both Punjab and Bengal, and 1971 subsequent Bangladesh Liberation War, where migrants who are migrants out of necessity are discriminated. Those who face bias in everyday life, these are often stories of people from the margin. And by marginal, uh, according to the difference in the context, we can mean the poor, the disabled, the children, the women, the minorities. And uh, by minorities, it will depend on the place and the context, of course. Uh, we could be a majority in one space and minority in the other. And even the animals, I say, who are denied space and acceptance in the mainstream, the people who lose power and are often forced to give up ground, even though they have lived and died for generations in a place. And this is so true, I think, in the present times. In the times of the raging NRC, which has been subdued by this lull, which has been created by the pandemic. And, of course, the pandemic which has created narratives of denial, intolerance, discrimination, separation, isolation of people who have had always a claim of the soil for reasons of birth or reasons of work, what we could refer to in some context, the karma boom. I approach select stories of 1947 partition and 1971 liberation war as discourses and attempts to claim homes and spaces. I see it from perspective of the less privileged, less privileged, as I told you, from various parameters, who would like to be the stakeholders in the scripting of the new nation, but are denied the right to do so. Such narratives are one of discrimination and denial. In many cases, of course, the protagonists do claim they, they, they are able to forge their demands and establish their identity, but largely they are disposes of loss and defeat. Uh, I would, in this uh, context, refer to also some of the storytellers of the Northeast and even our ancient legacy and storytellers like Taim Sula Ao, uh, whose tale, the last song, reminds us of the necessity of acknowledging the depths of the ancestors who have made our home as we inhabit it. For the long time, inhabitants of the South Asian subcontinent have had a crisis, the crisis of identifying the home and the self within the home. In fact, the home has been subtly wedded with the idea of unhomeliness. There has been a long stretch of British rule, of course, that's known, and then a painful freedom which came at the cost of partition based on religion. There has been an early attempt, there had been in 1905, by Lord Curzon to divide Bengal and similar lines which could be averted. But with 1947, it was a reality. Yet for the common people, our forefathers, this was a confused package. And this is the idea. I mean, the package uh, did not come as a very uh, a package where, which could be opened and it could produce dainties. It's not always that way. Yasmin Khan, I think many of you must have read, especially students, in our book, The Great Partition, 2007, shares an observation by an Indian civil servant, Malcolm Darling, who toured India on horseback at the end of 1946. Darling met hundreds of villagers on his ride, and they all answered questions about azadi or freedom. This is in the context of Punjab partition, of course. And their uh, responses were different. Uh, among a group of Punjabi Muslims, he noted, and I quote, the village headman riding with me were all supporters of the league. What is its object? I asked them. This is Darling asking them. And I quote, Sanun kuch pata nahi, we have no idea. So what was it about? It's all a confusion. Said one of them and another added, again I quote, it's an affair of the Muslims, unquote. A third was more explicit and said, and I quote, if there were no league, the Hindus would get the government and take away our land, unquote. In another village named Balkasar, he met prosperous members of the Khatri Sikh community who told him, I quote, Sikh and Muslim had lived together in harmony, but now with a cry of for partition, each eyes and the other critically and keeps apart, unquote. But surely you want Azadi? Darling asked. Azadi, said one of the younger men is, quote, Bebadi, destruction, and Pakistan is Kabristan, 
a graveyard in another village he goes on village after village riding he asked the difference between congress and the league someone piped up saying we don't bother about that another said pakistan meant our area and it goes in on in it must be separate the hindu area must be separate uh now we are slaves we are free we shall serve ourselves and do as we like then we shall gladly pay more taxes so basically the idea is that darling's account produces a uh, sort of confusion a very ambivalent response to this concept of azadi of course we uh, do not have to take it that this is a very authentic account but uh, at least this gives us an idea Mm, that it's it was no homogeneous uh, response no homogeneous discourse which came from the common people rather a cacophony of ideas and opinions uh, perhaps brilliantly reflected in manto's story to batik singh i won't uh, elaborate this this is too well known to everybody and the idea of bishan singh who dies in a no man's land manto's attempt at gibberish among the inmates of lahore asylum is an attempt to create polyphony of voices which compete with each other to achieve prominence yet get subsumed within the state rhetoric darling's account however i move on disregards the bengali so it's basically i told you the punjab partition so you know there's no concept of uh, the other side where the bengal partition is also happening shorter darker rice eating people of the wetter damper climate that is how joya chatterjee describes them in her book the spoils of partition it is true that has not had not this initial confusion happened in 1947 the east pakistanis would have never realized their true self this is true uh, then no comes about it their true identity their home the bangladesh in 1971 yet may i comment that the british politics was not about the gifting of a noble space for each of us by each i mean uh, the indians and the east pakistanis uh, later on the bangladeshis i return to borrow one of the significant observations of darling i quote what a hash politics there after to make of this tract where hindu muslim and sikh are mixed up as ingredients of a well made pulao so they were mixed up why to segregate them even darling please exactly a winter after darling's observation millions would be murdered homeless or destitute the granta book of travel identifies among the many causes of migration and travel one being the holocaust hordes of people in mad scramble for spaces for destinations and like adam travels other kinds of travels they do not know where they do not know where their destination is in literary representations and i will refer to also bangla texts like chiryasha gram by jivananda dash doamoir kotha by shunanda shikdar this has been translated as life long ago by onchita ghotok or shankochil by sharbani pututundo or even you know the much known train to pakistan mm. uh, by kushman singh uh, thus becomes a search for the order in the discourse the desired space in the words of henry lafab as argued in the production of space 1971 and the muted realization that narratives expressions of the many but powerless are equivalent to gibberish and that spatial patterns are not absolute but are shaped by social and economic systems dominated by institutions and individuals who wield political power it must be remembered that partition emerged from a cauldron of social disorder the indian economy which had completely geared towards feeding soldiers and supporting the second world war now shifted to a new direction the second world war and the partition bled into each other at the close of the war large painted hoardings in calcutta then calcutta could be seen sponsored by the biscuit maker britannia which depicted smiling uniformed soldiers The slogan in neat letters accompanying the picture spelled out the wartime food equation with stunning brevity. Their needs come first. The post-colonial sense of othering is as if conjectured in a lopsided manner. For the British, oblique Raj, the other, their, the fair, the absent as one's own. So the soldiers are not one's own. 
the soldiers only who have gone there are one's own as opposed to us that would mean those who are left behind the blacks the commoners us the you the black the common indians bengalis the present who are the ones disowned sides position stands challenged in non settler colony with the absent others at home in britain in the war are one's own a shocking lesson that calcutta had come to feel only too painfully so those who are sons of the soil daughters of the soil they are disowned and those who are fighting there also the whites they are our own in the bengal famine of 1943 the bengali public had left been left starving to death and perhaps as many as 3 million died because of shoddy government food allocation skewed political priorities so when rat crib drew the neat line with surgical precision cutting across the bosom of the subcontinent the pain had to be immense in luton house delhi it was referred to as operation quote and quote and i feel in precise sense of the term an operation which basically cuts through your body your mind and your soul the muffled voices of partition however refused to fit into the neat cartographies as known to us all in mulkra janans and here i talk about the uh, birds and animals the parrot in the cage rukminai and her parrot ran pillar to post to understand where her is her home in new india the parrot persists nitun kithe hai tumi kothay acho or where are you and of rukminai is repeated I quote, "Son, I do not know where I am." In Mohan Rakesh's story, the proprietor of the debris, similarly, the dog shoes away the crow to claim the sole proprietorship of the ruins of Chirag Din's house. Chirag Din, whose family had been butchered by the Hindu goon Rakha, albeit the dog's occupation of a Muslim's house, although debris in Amritsar, after having defeated the claim of a crow, subverts and challenges the claim of Rakha. so the tree a crow wins over rakha the dog creates a comic absurdity a dark humor as in manto's story the dog of kithwal where the dog is variously christian as junjun and sunsun by the indian and the pakistani soldiers to the end of the story the dog is alternately leered and shot by both the parties till he limps becomes injured and ultimately dies ironically the dog's death even the dog doesn't find a home and a space the cases of the animals and the birds in the literature of partition create a combination of the fearful and the ludicrous this is what lee byron jennings would term as grotesque a grotesque object of phenomenon simultaneous arouses reactions of fear and amusement in the observer the formation of fear images is intercepted at its very onset by the comic tendency the formation of fear sorry and the resulting object reflects this interaction of opposing forces the bizarre and the grotesque is further created in figures of the dying sikh in manto's thanda gosht and the melodramatic sikh in wapsi sidwas short story defend yourself against me the dying sikh the rapist of a dead muslim girl is full of retribution while the melodramatic sikhs fall flat on the ground and i quote as if they are about to do push ups look at this kind of comedy grotesque comedy that's created in the short stories of partition they ask for forgiveness of an old woman who had been raped and sold in the market by their fathers children of partition are equally and metaphorically stunted and eerie they have adult minds trapped in children's bodies as bibi natia hussein's after the storm possibly the best expression of the case of children we all know statistical documentation has been made in urvashi butalias the other side of silence its precise this is other side of silence or apparent aphasia is what one could term a meta history or an addition or an extension of history that which completes the history of partition rather than belonging to the realm of illogical in the order of discourse for co rights and i quote to some extent since the depth of the middle ages the madman i include the mad of manto stories the old the animals the birds the six in this category has been one in whose discourse than said gibberish cannot have the same currency as other 
His word may be considered null and void, having neither truth nor importance, worthless as evidence in law, inadmissible in the authentication of deeds and contracts. In a separate context, unquote, in a separate context, historians Shugato Bhaduri and Aisha Jalal admit that partition has been much better depicted in literature than in history. One might, therefore, further understand that the apparent absurdity of the non-human, non-adult, non-male, non-Hindu, non-Muslim characters depict an alternative conception of reality. Something like what Kamu would conceive in the myth of Sisyphus. Kamu refers to the primitive hostility of the world and likewise to the inhuman quality of natural and cultural environment. This primitive, I quote, strangeness of the world, he insists, is the absurd. Kamu also asserts that in a number of ways, human life secrets, I quote, the inhuman. He emphasizes the absurd expresses a fundamental disharmony, a tragic incompatibility, therefore again the sense of unhomeliness in our existence. In effect, he argues that the absurd is a product of collision or confrontation between over human desire for order, meaning and purpose in life and the blank, indifferent, quote, silence of the universe. The absurd is neither in the man nor in the world, but in their presence together. And partition is this kind of a presence, the absurd presence. Absurd is carnivalous in the Bakhtinian sense, that capacity for satire and parody, which threatens to mock at, topple, and usurp the supposed truth, the grand narrative of the few, and replace it with the heresy of the personal narratives of many. If non human children, the mad, are the excluded, the nominals who create an absurd world of meta history, it is the figure of the refugee woman who is and challenges the dominant cultural nationalism that takes a specific shape in late 19th century Bengal and continues through the early 20th century in the post-independence, post-partition nation. I'll, by the way, uh, you know, slightly uh, in a scattered manner shift from, you know, Bengal to Punjab and then, you know, uh, from the... Uh, um, Urdu writers to the Bangla writers, so uh, might be, you know, uh, it will follow uh, not a very clear, definitely logic, but the logic of, uh, I would say, you know, the, uh, the, the cause why I'm saying so would apparently be clear in the due course of time, I believe so. The refugee woman precisely challenges the idea of homogeneous nationalism, the cultural nationalism, that is patriarchal, class privileged, and caste Hindu in character, and was dominant and deeply influential in the later course of all nationalisms, not only in Bengal, but elsewhere in India as well. The words of Polomi Chakraborty, I quote, a salient feature of this nationalism was that within its imagery, women were constructed as signs of the nation, erasing women's essential subjectivity and women's claim to the nation, unquote. The partition of Bengal into two halves not only resulted in two geographical halves, but also cracking down of shared history, culture, and polity. The next 25 years brought further complication to the complex arrangement until 1971, when East Pakistan became independent nation state Bangladesh. Within 1946 to 64, about 5 million Hindus entered from East Pakistan to Bengal, Assam, Tripura, while in the same period, a lesser number of about a million and a half Muslims left West Bengal, Bihar, Assam, Tripura to go to East Bengal. Uh, the source is Spoils of Partition, uh, Joya Chatterjee. The figure of the refugee woman is a doubly marginalized figure in the sense of Spivak's double jeopardization. I do not need to explain this. She in a way is disenfranchised within the nationalist discourse, but also remains crucially visible in the discourse. She is a liminal figure both in and outside the practices of normative nationalism. Partition texts and liberation war texts presents the refugee vis a vis the post colonial woman, as a radical figure, indicating the concomitant violence committed when politically, in particular discourses, women turn from metonyms to metaphors. They become pure substitutes. They are the nation. Here, 
there would be should be a useful reminder that women are best thought as a category not a community women we we can say uh, till today that they are not a community they can be at best a category western intellectuals and they will corporate to this fact uh, like elaine baliber formulate that i quote from an emancipatory standpoint gender is not unquote in catherine mackinnon's words quote feminism has no theory of the state unquote since the idea of dorothy smith quote the personal is political the small events small histories when in domestic space are affected by and in turn affect the larger political world indeed women's deeply gendered embodied individual lives within the domestic space of every day are minutely governed by big events in the masculine public political sphere perhaps even more so in the men's lives in than men's lives the most violent impression in this sense is on the life and the body of chobiran in jahanara imam story ostra where the nation becomes the metaphor of a woman chobiran is raped by rajakas and this is in context of the bangladesh liberation war within pots and pans in her kitchen and home the apparently decided discourse is problematized when chobi moves inside this normative discourse to fight the rajakas along with mofis using the same body as a weapon i think all of us are aware of the uh, story of uh, fact of dopti mejan and uh, also dropodin mohashaka devi's story uh, in the similar lines and similar lines uh, she makes her body a weapon thereby positing a counter narrative of a defiled woman challenges the essential purity and morality of a gendered nation the moment a defiled woman claims her part in making the history of a nation she ceases to be a metaphor or a substitution she becomes a metonym or a part separable albeit of the nation therefore she has a claim in scripting of the history of the nation and the new nation yet most histories and literature stop at the depiction of the metaphor and the others tram is able to desecrate the sanctity of the metaphor remembering stasa sovik's assertion quote the female womb becomes the occupied territory bhag phal akattor meder katha edited jhorna bos basu is a collection of memoirs of women migrants or refugees of the bangladesh liberation war using the typical trope of personal is political the narratives of ilarani ghosh kiran moy mondol roxana dil afroz speak of everyday life and its permanent alteration with the advent of mukti juddh uh the concept of bhite mati or incidentally bhite mati or home and soil and incidentally few of the many objects that have helped particularly women to relate refresh and remember the memories anchal malotra's recent treatise on material memory emphasizes how objects and material become aids to recollection and preservation of memory that means uh, if you are migrating then how do material objects uh, help you to remember the space you leave your home once and probably that soil which you carry and then the soil or the plant if you plant in your new space then can you claim that space do you have a a, a claim in that space that's the question i go back so uh, malotra's recent treatise on material memory emphasizes the objects and materials become aids to recollection and preservation of memory for men they become objects of social and political importance for women they are often trivia of domestic importance in a way the grandmother of shanta sen uh, her memory of her grandmother shanta sen's memory plucked a few fruits in the lichu tree in borishal tied them in a bundle and set out she left behind i quote the trees and plants around the house courtyard and garden she looked at her bedroom in the large wing the kitchen in the north wing the cow shed facing east the husking room under the guava tree gaikhola and digambar two ponds filled with black water 
the large tank covered with water hyacinth and bade farewell to all of them. Unquote. Roxana de la Flores commented in her memoir that in liberated Bangladesh, the economic insecurity was greater. Echoing Fano's critique, the pitfalls of national consciousness, that the intermediaries of free state duplicated the colonial strategy to power women as a part of establishing hegemony and patriarchy something which is also reiterated in a similar way in Parker Chatterjee's writings. Afros's memoir does not depict women as active agents or as sexual paragons of virtue in a free land, but rather a certain resistance to recording rhetoric of an imaginary, utopic, post-colonial, patriarchal space, which makes her a stakeholder, a part of the nationalist discourse, in the sense of metonymy rather than a metaphor. Basically, uh, Afros uh, in her narratives, you know, tries to say how uh, the uh, uh, woman in the new land becomes a breadwinner or a bread earner after the death of her husband, on how she uh, braces herself, how she gives up a, gives a tough fight uh, to the patriarchs and tries to uh, carve her own destiny, her own history and thereby, you know, becomes a sex stakeholder or a metonymy, uh, a, a woman who is not so pure, a woman who can be called a virago okay. in the nation, and therefore, you know, somebody who is someone in this new nation, which is being carved. I continue. The customary attempt to represent women as crushed victims of partition and mukti juddha or the liberation war, are repeatedly challenged in the non-fictional oral histories as well as their fictional counterparts. A small instance from Days of My Bleeding Heart by Begum Mushtari Shafi, this is a translation, establishes the alternative narrative, I unquote. I don't know politics, I do not understand politics, yet I felt things were not quite right, unquote. And then as she moves in, you know, she moves from uh, 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 from Bangladesh to uh, Tripura and then again back to Bangladesh. So in this kind of a journey, you know, once in the Agartala camp, uh, she says, I quote, but I want to keep myself busy. From today, I started distributing milk powder, recording in the master role Mr. Shah gave me in the recipient's name, age, quantity of milk powder issued. She got a small remuneration from Red Cross for this job. There's another uh, woman who's writing, this is in English now, uh, Farida Huck's Journey Through 1971, a memoir, in the way of Shafi, trace fellow feelings among Bengalis of the two sides which shared emotions for, for Robindro Shongit and Nojul Giti as a part of common language and culture. They establish a distinct woman subculture, if you would like so in Ellen Showalter's words, like Shafi's efforts in Shadhin Bangla Betar and the efforts of women to keep help Bangladeshi artists and refugees. Huck's memoirs bring up a picture of women as saviors, sustainers of men and women during long years of crisis. Huck remembers singing hopes and despair together in Quetta which was a Pakistani camp. I quote, we end up singing, Ama Shonar Bangla, we love you. Adept in camp life, we led a novel indigenous life of hardship, sharing our hopes and despair together, unquote. Now compared to other uh, official records of the 1971 war, like uh, uh, which, which of course records the genocide, uh, uh, properly, so statistically, I would say, database, like say one like um, by A.K.M. Nasimul Kamal, or say a more popular book in Bangla, Moidul Hassan's Muldhara Akattor. Shafi's or Huck's accounts and the memoirs of unknown woman in Huck Paul Akattor may be pale and worn, but they definitely fill in spaces, silences and gaps regarding women and children in official records. Their conspicuous absence in any polity and ineffectiveness in nation building is interrogated and negotiated. 
i shift a bit again to you know uh, one of the uh, for 1947 partition narratives uh, uh, this is uh, jyotirmoyi devi's epar ganga upar ganga and there uh, there is a, a, a peculiar case and uh, the interpretation this interpretation is my polomi chakraborty uh, in the refugee woman partition of bengal gender and the political where she posits that the protagonist sutara's silence about her possible rape during partition becomes a counter narrative to the patriarchal boyer's description of the victimization of the woman's body her aphasia in a way robs the opportunity of male gaze and the subsequent imagination building confusion over whether the rape had actually happened so she would not be covered down she would keep silent so the silence can also be a counter attack her refusal to speak about it in words renders the male act to be beyond words and beyond language sutara in a way like a real counterpart shofi and hak take up the mantle of a working woman actively contributing to her psychological sanity as well as contributing meaningfully to the society nation and the community in which she is situated the migrant refugee woman's literal metaphorical and possible defilement and her ability to surmount the stigma by playing active role once again shifts the conception of a gendered nation from being only the asexual nubile mother to the resisting daughter or a wife or even a partner who becomes as i said earlier a stakeholder in the scripting of the nation so once again as i as i say claiming the home claiming the space the consciousness of the refugee woman waking up into cramped compromised spaces post migration is reiterated in both memoirs and fiction shikha haldar bithi chakraborty or ila bondopadhyay oshima in the four poster by narendra rat mitra by the way shikha haldar bithi chakraborty ila bondopadhyay they all speak in memoirs while oshima is a fictional protagonist in the story four poster by narendra mitra in india the refugees therefore prefer to use the term udbastu or bastuhara that would mean i mean one who had lost their homes rather than you know seeking refuge in that sense so they are not people who are to be uh, you know uh, uh, to be uh, uh, graced upon they are not people who are uh, to be pitied upon they are people who are claiming their lost homes the promised home which was to be given to them so that's the concept yet all of them including oshima and in the fiction emerge into the nascent stages of becoming providers for their families at the teeth of extreme poverty mm, this is an excerpt from the four poster uh, i quote you know how damp and unhealthy our flat in belaghata is the children have to sleep on the floor your beloved kanu tenu reena meena are laid up with fever the medical bill is going up every month and i ask your son to buy cots he says he short of money that is why i have this request to me please sell our fourth poster bet and got rachel weber a feminist geographer gives a new dimension to the concept of compromise spaces in a woman refugee's life i quote with the crumbling of the many walls that separated the existence from outside wall world in east bengal the houses in calcutta became susceptible to mobilization of women into political economic social and communal spheres it was far more gradual process than an instant transformation women did not step out of the domestic lives but domesticity began to include new public duties from the so political social and economic sphere somehow orchid basu choudhury sees a certain empowerment in the process where the tryst with the taste of freedom was similar for most women the nascent stages of public duty visa vi domestic duty were fraught with conflicts of gender in particular that they were overcome only after the gradual exposure to the outside world yet in the hands of the authors male and historians women have time and again become images of pity loss and irretrievable sadness as bani in uttar boshonte or atoja vyakti korobi gach these are stories by hasan 
Azizul Haq. In Azizul Haq, like uh, or or in Begum Mushtari Shafi's or in Shamuresh Boshur or in Narendra Mitra's short stories, it is possible rather to discern a post-colonial context where the acquired space is problematized with unequal distribution of wealth, capital, and space to the migrants. It is possible to read Uttar Boshante as a treatise on refusal of the capitalist post-colonial lackeys to enable the traumatized migrants to earn and to become solvent. It is not Bani, the protagonist, who is important as an individual, but Bani as a proletariat in a system. The event, the context as partition, which has broken the backbone of the family in a manner which is irretrievable. The darkness in Bani's home is literal and metaphorical, literal since the partition and the subsequent migration has killed the elder daughter since the house, the house of the old, the sick and the insane, vis-a-vis the, -vis the excluded who do not and cannot earn. In the household, breakfast includes a stale roti and a piece of jajari. Lunch would mean yesterday's leftovers with hot steaming rice and the steaming rice being the only delicacy. Marx had talked primarily about the urban working classes and the unequal distribution of capital, which in the post-60s has become inextricably linked to the unequal distribution of resources and access to live living elements of nature, air, water, and soil. Eco-socialists argue that class inequalities, and here I'm talking about the poor shifting from the women, so class inequalities influence the experience of the environment. Eco-socialism suggests that the difference in the distribution of wealth is at the base of such an experience of environment. Social exclusion leads to environmental exclusion, where the poorer classes do not have the same access to clean air or water. Bani's household, therefore, does not have access even to clean water. Utensils are scrubbed and washed in the rotten pond with a water full of algae and stench. Similarly, in Mushtari Shafi's another anthology, Ekushir Golpo, Definitely 21st February, Bhasha Andolon, or the, uh, the protest for the language, as we all know, we, which paved the way for 1971 Liberation War. And these stories are written remembering the Bhasha Andolon. So Mushtari Shafi's Ekushir Golpo, likewise, narratives of the death of the poor, who is even denied the last drop of water to drink by the upper classes. Similarly, women and physical environment might as well be brought to the same level. As eco-feminists would say, the old and sick protagonist, guilt and despair, in vending her daughter for a living, takes a metaphor and a shape in the Korobi Gach, another story, which is planted not for flowers, but for the poison to be found in its seeds. Huck's Atoja or Ikti Korobi Gach is about the pains of women and plants who are raised only to be killed with gall. In the post partition scenario, it foregrounds the deliberated state of the poor, the sick, just as it posits that both women and nature are equally oppressed by the male ways of thinking and action. However, there are characters like Wadu Rejauddin in Shafi stories or the unknown man in Shamuresh Boshu's Adab. They are men in symphony with nature. As villagers, they have a natural tie with soil and water. The artificial culture of the urban world rejects them. Their values and emotions for 21st February are mocked at by the individuals who make an annual ritual of the auspicious occasion. Stories like Shofi's, uh, the context is uh, of these stories, uh, it's, it's independent, New Bangladesh, 1971, which remembers 21st February 1952. How do they remember? How do the rich remember? How do the poor remember? How does uh, you know the the uh, working class? How do they remember? And are they so distinct? And uh, what is this discrimination? Uh, Shafi's Horit Shorshir Gan and Onno Minare. These are two stories. Seem to reiterate the travesty which the elite make of Asha Andolon. And the unknown, unknown, or the alternative, 
uh, ways in which the proletariat make meaning of the symbol. By the way, in these stories, the proletariat, the common, the working class, they are denied uh, inclusion in these elaborate, very organized uh, shows of respect and homage to the Bhasha Andalon martyrs. So, you know, uh, there's an alternative meaning in which the poor try to find meaning in uh, rethinking and remembering the making of a nation. Marx and Engels' proposition is that the, I quote, the capitalist mode of production justified and naturalized itself to certain patterns of thought or ideas with social structures such as education, culture, and religion. The oppressed classes believe that the order of inequality in society is natural, a preordained, and do not recognize that they are oppressed. The system of thought or representation that helps naturalize economic inequality and oppression is termed ideology. So the very skewed perspective that uh, mm, the ideology is something which is uh, beneficial uh, for uh, or easy for the capitalists, the rich, the few. Ideology is writings, beliefs, speeches, opinions, cultural practices that assert the naturalness and necessity of economic practices. The ideology, therefore, an instrument of power because it helps prop up the dominant classes by naturalizing exploitative relationship and convincing the working classes that this is how things are. And we all know Marx termed it false consciousness. In Shafi stories, there is a realization of this false consciousness, but also an attempt to break through it. I'm coming towards the end. Uh, Amurtu Shen, in his social development paper number one, he refers to the parameters of social exclusion and to the list of, I quote, mentally and physically handicapped, suicidal people, aged invalids, abused children, unquote. He adds, this was the original list. So Shane adds, I quote, immigrants are refugees who are not given a usable political status. Sen turns it act active exclusion, which actually refers to unheard or ignored narratives, a sizable chunk of reality. Prohibited, as said earlier, by those who have the power of discourse. It is necessary that these discourses be heard be enabled to form meta-histories, trajectories of the niminals in claiming the nation. Uh, I'll end by uh, something I read about while I was going through the Hindu. Uh, this this uh, new author, Annie Zaidi, uh, who in a recent book, however, has an optimistic note, you know, in spite of these failings or uh, being unable to actively contribute and claim the nation. Uh, she says uh, in her book, Bread, Cement, Cactus, a memoir of belonging and dislocation. I quote, uh, though the world around us may change, something of home remains within. This too is a way to define home and by home you could say the nation as that which we have lived. So, you know, any kind of living, uh, it might be uh, the an active living where uh, there are many women who could claim. Um, it could be a failed living according to those who could not make meaning out of it. Uh, and I continue with this quotation, and that which will not leave us, and she includes the love that will not quit on us, our social habits, our sources of self-esteem, hunger, shame, genes, fragments of solidarity, refuge, and undisturbed rest. So according to Zaidi, basically, uh, these all are histories. Even if we have lived lives of shame, even if we have lived lives of hunger and a fragmented life, but still we have in a way tried in our own way to claim spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Tonma. Uh, if you have any doubts, any questions.
yes ma'am thank you uh, for this uh, uh, wonderful presentation as i promised our uh, audience that uh, they are going to have a one two sessions uh, from ma'am so uh, i was right and uh, uh, now as we requested the, the participants to put their or drop their questions or observation if they have any in the comment section so uh, ma'am i'm making it visible to your screen mm -hmm. Fortunately, you could also read them to me. I mean, so uh, should I uh, read them out or? Yes, I can read. The question is Anonna Bhat from Anonna Bhattacharya, ma'am. Would you comment on the double bind trauma violated women tagged as Birangona? Yes, who are neither respected by the society nor wholeheartedly accepted by the second and the third generations in their family. Yes, this is uh, an obvious uh, question. Yes, which you put uh, uh, on. I hope uh, she can hear me. Uh, yes, there is a, a long history of these birangonas, you know, or uh, women who had been raped uh, uh, during the or molested or uh, you know uh, during the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War, and who had been later on. given an elevated status of uh, birangonas or who had uh, actively contributed to the making of the nation yes this is a kind of i would say an ambivalence where you know the term birangona becomes a sort of a travesty to these women who uh, on the one hand uh, uh, in i would say in the grand narratives you know uh, they uh, are in or in i would say in the state narratives there is a sort of i would say a uh, a uh, a uh, forceful clamping down of accepting them as uh, uh, martyrs martyrs of their i would say bodies in this uh, noble war but uh, at the uh, at the family level at the domestic level they are still unwanted so basically you know this as i was telling you bhagfal akator you know this also talks about you know these women who are facing a double crisis double bind bind trauma yes you are right you know of uh, these women who had been violated and um, uh, this discrimination carries on where you know many of them couldn't put up they had uh, uh, committed suicide but uh, um, a large number of them you know they have tried to cope up with the crisis i think uh, you were right you know in uh, what you are trying to claim that uh, they are doubly Uh, yes jeopardize it's true it's true but uh, 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 there are various uh, responses as to how they are coping up and uh, these are two narratives as uh, uh, like in i i think this is true of also the 1947 uh, narrative where you know uh, the molested uh, women uh, they could uh, take up two choices uh, one to continue to fight back like sutara's case as i told you or you know or uh, uh, chobi rans case as i told you but uh, they could also go into oblivion that's it i think can more any other comments or questions uh, yes ma'am i'm just uh, trying to find them out okay, so, so uh, i request the participants if they have any questions so they can write them down in the if comments there are any yes. any comments if there are any or if you uh, find he or uh, when you will go through this lecture if you find or uh, if you have any questions later you can also address to me and i will convey ma'am i will can convey them to ma'am uh, so in that case uh, we can also take questions after the which is over so the, from the participants who are who have listened to ma'am stop i request them if you have any questions or observation Have any queries in your mind? So you can put them down. Yes, uh, it's from Kusa Kanti. Okay, this is from Kusa Kanti Karmo Ka. Okay, impact of partition. Kusa, uh, I think uh, uh, this question, you know, the impact. If we say the impact of partition, I think. so long i was talking about the impact by impact definitely we can say what is the after effect 
or uh, what uh, has it resulted isn't it i mean if we take it that way then definitely if you think about uh, at the political level the partition has been of immense gain say if if you think of both the sides of the story then at the official level it has been a lot of uh, a game gain for the politicians who had wanted you know um representation of themselves in the political parties in the new nations say at that level but uh, at the level of the commoners you know there was a lot of loss except again the rich who could manage to stay on with their big houses as i was towards the last part of my lecture i was talking uh, about you know the uh, the use of the resources the natural resources even you know after partition or the the uh, claim on the capital after the uh, partition so for the rich it has been probably the easy lives but easy life but uh, uh, i would say oh you you want uh, uh, an explanation on animals okay fine uh, that was not there in the question anyway so um, uh, you see when i went through the uh, stories you know of uh, um, partition then you see i uh, saw that animals were often animals in their own right sometimes they were also symbolic like say when i was talking to you about the story uh, uh, dog of titwal then uh, this animal becomes uh, symbolic of the fate of the soldiers you know who were uh, neither in this side or that and uh, this dog would also be symbolic of the common man who uh, is uh, uh, now uh, i would say a victim of partition who runs to this and that side and then ultimately cannot claim any of the space as its own and ultimately get killed this is one the other is that you know the animals also add to the absurdity you know if i say impact i won't say impact that way because you see uh, in the sense you know animal often make symbolic uh, uh, manifestations in the stories mm, the animals you see they uh, like say the parrot okay who accompanies rukmina as i was trying to tell you the parrot basically uh, reiterates or echoes what rukmina was feeling that she is lost in this new place where she has migrated to and the parrot constantly you know asks her as a kind of an inner voice you know an extension of her voice as to where are we and rukmina cannot answer so the sense of loss the sense of you know uh, not being anywhere the crisis which they face this is also manifested in one of these characters the parrot okay uh, so okay this is mahin uh, i think uh, let me finish this then i'll i'll take this question uh, the last thing uh, uh, is that can i hold on this question let me finish uh, what i was answering uh, mm, uh, uh, the, uh, the other uh, idea was you know the idea of uh, uh, the crow you know who comes and sits the dog and the crow who comes and sits on the debris you know of a uh, 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 ruined uh, house by a goon a goon who has rubbled the house of a muslim a parrot and a crow come and the goon had told you know that uh, nobody would be able to sit and claim this house so when the uh, when the animals come symbolically they make again a travesty again a symbolic travesty of uh, Uh, the uh, the claim that uh, this uh, uh, there are goons you know uh, i would say uh, presence that nobody can be greater than me so the animals again make an absurd uh, context or situation where they become greater than human beings so creating a sort of a very dark comedy in that sense so they are very symbolic uh, in their presences and uh, that is how partition you know without realizing affects them if you can say so uh the next question on my uh, thing mahin okay the way holocaust literature kind of a remembrance resistance warning for future generations yes yes so uh, holocaust your question is uh, holocaust literature like holocaust literature can we say partition literature in india is a kind of remembrance of course of course you see uh, uh, for lack of time we did not uh, go into the concept of post memory as we
talk you know um, hers talks about you know post memory and uh, she says that um, uh, of course partition literature can be definitely termed as holocaust literature and uh, all holocaust literature uh, remembers you know for the future generations and preserves for the future generations the idea of uh, uh, an event you know which uh, the gen- that generation uh, would never see for themselves but at the same time uh, that which is probably very important to identify themselves and to carve out a history behind them so partition literature like holocaust literature definitely would hand down a sense of identity a sense of i would say positioning a sense of finding out one's own self vis-a-vis the lost history which we are trying to hold on to i think it's very important yes the idea of post memory what is the difference okay what is the difference between the feeling of the marginalized women and that of the women who are compelled to go outside of the native land okay fine okay uh shonda this is an interesting question um you see i'll i'll give you an example like say if you go through the uh, memoirs you know uh of uh, a partition you know towards say 1946 47 the women's memoirs uh, uh some of the memoirs uh, uh, they are published very famously you know this book the trauma and the triumph okay where you see uh, some of the women like the muslim women who were living in and around calcutta Uh, they had chosen to move out of uh, their native land and you know who had tried to uh, go and settle down you know in uh, uh, today's bangladesh then east pakistan and uh, there are also women okay uh, who had uh, like say uh, if i remember rightly nasreen jahan okay so one of them who had chosen to stay back because you know she was from a lady family she believed in broad nationalistic principles and uh, she had chosen to you know stay back but you see according to jahan you know uh, she uh, uh, very vehemently defies the idea in spite of being a muslim or say visavi marginalized in a way you know uh, in the new land you know she feels that she was a part of the broader scenario she had the uh, a good uh, fortune to meet gandhi as she says in her memoirs or narratives but of course you know uh, if you say marginalized women common women not women like jahan who were who did not belong to an elite family they were deprived definitely you know from education they were ghettoed in particular places you know selective places where uh, such marginalized women or say minority women could stay after partition now visa we if you think of uh, women who had chose to say move out of their native land say from uh, india to east pakistan uh, mm-hmm. then you know for these women also their narratives tell us that uh, they found not very easy you know to uh, uh say uh, to get assimilated or to get acculturated you know to the new land there was a problem of language there was a problem of culture where there this differentiation in spite of belonging to a same religion this difference of being you know uh, of a uh, uh, different uh, part of the land that means of uh, of west bengal in case she is moving to east bengal you know this difference was always there so on uh, the basis of cultural differences uh, on the basis of say accent and language you know they found it difficult to cope up uh, in the new space that they were accorded so these are uh, some of the uh, ideas which i share from the memoirs which i have read i think uh, this is yes oh, one more question we will take ma'am okay so, how partition affected race gender and religion how politics is responsible for such flights okay this is a very broad question okay so uh, you see uh, this is i think a very uh, big question that you uh, pose in the sense that you see uh, 
while i would i would ask you uh, i would answer you in this way you see uh, while 1947 partition you know it uh, talked about you know the ease that would come if the land would be divided in base of in, on the basis of religion you see that is uh, what uh, um, 1947 partition did okay and uh, uh, politics was of course you know the political leaders were responsible for this uh, uh, the british in connivance with the uh, then congress and the league they decided that if the country would be divided on religious lines then it would be good now that had been in the later stage you know it had been subverted why because you see uh, in spite of the fact that uh, west pakistan and east pakistan later on bangladesh they had the same uh, religion it failed okay so uh, the plight was that in spite of that you know uh, west pakistan continued to dominate east pakistan and then that uh, a partition happened the later partition i would say the second continuous partition which gave uh, uh, bangladesh is bangladesh you know it happened uh, uh, on the lines of language and not religion so you see uh, i would say that for you know the politics uh, which you find you know responsible in safety into pakistan in commerce in this case you know uh, it is validated that uh, if you divide the land on the basis of religion it doesn't always hold good okay now uh, if you talk about gender definitely then you see uh, women have always been scapegoats this is a very general issue you know see um as we know that you know balibar's idea or you know uh, the general idea that uh, the occupation of the womb has been a triumph you know uh, the whole idea of partition is a largely a patriarchal affair so you know uh, the occupation of the body of the woman whether it be you know uh, the uh, 1947 or 1971 you know it has always been a matter of triumph so you see women has have been very badly affected you know this is a very broad and a general answer which i can uh, give you and definitely you see uh, if you talk about race definitely the uh, race of the you know the punjabis uh, if i talk of, about the separation of the punjabis and the bengalis you know then uh, uh, definitely the wheat eating the fairer the taller the broader punjabis you know uh they were separated from the uh, darker the shorter the rice eating uh, bengalis and uh, uh if that has created a sort of an ease this homogeneity probably it was thought that this homogeneity of race would probably ease people's lives but we see that hasn't happened in the long run probably there has been smaller partition and there has been uh politics intra politics inside you know which has made uh, uh, probably lives difficult for even for after such homogeneous separations it has continued you know even if race has been uh, separated their gender has gone in language has gone in but overall i would say my answer would be gender in this case has been always affected everywhere i think i could answer your question uh in a broad manner okay uh, sir i i see your posts your very erudite posts uh, uh your question is i would so like to from, know whether uh, these yes chandrakant uh, alanda from chandrakant uh, sir from from shivaji university yes yes i i i see his post so i understand so uh yes definitely these narratives are uh, a very important question uh, your question is foreground the impasse of modern women who are ubiquitously subjugated in many ways yes definitely uh, the subjugation continues but uh, as i repeat you know there are very many instances where you know uh, women uh, could question interrogate and could sort of penetrate through this i would say this hard you know sealing this wall which uh, which uh, sort of resists them and as i repeat to you you know a large part of my talk was about how modern women are continuously questioning whether you know sometimes it is even in their silence or sometimes you know even in in uh, by taking you know detours by 
uh, behaving as i would say you know there are many narratives of 1971 where women uh, they uh, they uh, live a life of i would say you know um Mm, uh, uh, not a very courteous life, you know. They resist in, uh, uh, you know, street smart manners. So you know, these are narratives which talk about very common ways in which women have tried to break through and question, you know, uh, uh, the patriarchal ways and norms. So I think yes, definitely this foregrounding. The memoirs say, the stories say, uh, the uh, the fictional, uh, uh, you know, the stories. They they uh, all they all say. Talk about this definitely. You are right, sir. In this, you are right. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. Uh, have I gained uh, uh, this question answer uh, session? And uh, it's time for the formal vote of thanks. And for that, I request our students of UG fifth semester, so I will put it here to offer the vote of thanks to ma'am. And we are really fortunate, and we are honored. I mean, the college actually honored to have you, ma'am, uh, in our lecture. Thank you so much. I'm humble. I'm humble. So, Thank you so much. So I request Soily. Soily, are you there? Soily, what is your year? Sir. Yes. Okay, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I, Soily Bhattacharya. A student of UG fifth sem, on behalf of the Department of English, Medhnapur College Autonomous, would like to present my sincere gratitude to our honourable guest, Dr. Sarmista Chatterjee Srivastav, ma'am, who, with her intellectual, has enlightened us with such a wonderful presentation. We are thankful to our respected principal, sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Bera. Who has solicited great efforts to arrange such online lecture series? I'd also like to convey my gratitude to our respected Tonmoy Kundu sir and Soikat Sarkar sir, who have actually enabled this lecture series to take reality and making our lockdown days really meaningful and enjoyable. I, it would be impossible to make it possible a success without them. Last but not the least. I also appreciate all the participants across India for their selfless participation in their lecture series and uh, made it a success. In the end, I would like to thank everyone involved in this session and for their endless efforts and enthusiasm. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much.